the questions, how creative are players allowed to be in AD&D 3.5 and 5e? And we also answered the question, how enjoyable is character creation? Now, whether or not we did a good job answering those questions is all up to you, the listener. Well, it's up to them for you guys. Objectively, Justin and I won. Um, nobody's won yet. We still have like Three more. I believe go. three five was clearly the best. The worst. Character. Yeah. Yeah. Good that job. was the worst. Nailed no, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The best. <laughs> <laughs> to remind you, audience, we have a rubric, very scientific, very official, that I am with an unbiased attitude filling out as our debaters make points. We have James debating for 5e as the superior version of D&D. James, would you like to say hi? No, I feel like you pretty much, you said it was superior, you said my name, that's really all that matters right now. (laughs) And then we have Justin also joining him on the 5e team. Justin? Just cut and paste James's answer. Lazy. Then we have Matt Hart. Efficient. Joining us for 3.5. Do you want to say hi, Matt? Hey, everybody. Just for the record, 3.5, clearly the best. Yeah, these guys are competitive. Okay, and then we have Kimmy. You guys know Kimmy. Do we? She's debating for AD&D being the superior version. <coughs> Poorly. Whoa. Um. Ex- excuse me. We we will let we will let the questions and the answers uh, determine that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I am also on Kimmy's team, but at the same time, I have to be a neutral grader, and I know how to do this. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Question number three. What are the benefits for the dungeon master? All of them. That wasn't a fair start. Is Someone that your... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dang, <laughs> oh, I took it. <laughs> so, so like, I think the, the, the premise of this question is, what version of D&D is the most fun for a dungeon master and, and, and the most, like, beneficial for a dungeon master? Like, what makes this great for us as a dungeon master, for those that have, have done it? Sure. That's mm-hmm. what the question's asking. And um, I'm just going to go with... I'm going to start... AD&D has a lot of great creative options. Since since the world is not so it's not so pre-written, um, it allows for a lot of kind of like just filling in the gaps almost for the dungeon master. So they get to create what people see, they get to create what people hear, um, and all sorts of stuff like that. And there's really there's really not like um, I don't know. I I just think creative wise. I have a lot more creative muse playing an A, D, and D version um, than I do looking at 5E. I just feel like I'm almost constrained when I'm playing 5E. Specifically, I'm not DM'd 3.5, so I can't say anything, but um, I just like how free reign it is in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So 3.5 shares a lot of those qualities. We also have a huge pool of monsters to pull from. We don't have as many pre-written modules, pre-written worlds as 5e has. One of my biggest problems with 5e, though, is that the amount of magic items, artifacts, and loot that exist in 5e with the base game and with the modules that have been released so far is just incredibly limited. I have, I want to say, 35 to 40 pages of magical items and then, like, another 10 pages of artifacts in 3.5 that I can use, give to my players, use to add spice to my campaign that's already been added that I don't have to sit down and come up with all these stats for. Whereas in 5e, you have, like, ten pages. Still a lot of pages of magic items. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't have a lot of magic items, but just think about it for a sec. Everybody just appreciate it. We got a lot of magic items, period. Ten pages worth of stuff to come over. Um, but that's fair. I, I guess I want to clarify something before we go any further. Are we talking about, and there's probably multiple facets to this, are we talking about how buck wild you can get with your campaign with this or are we talking about just fun for the dm from whatever mechanical perspective oh, whatever because... i think honestly whatever you think is more enjoyable as a dm if your yeah. dming style is sure. going buck wild then yes which one would you think is the best if mm-hmm. your dming style is you know um how easy is it for me to play the pre-written stuff 
and bring that into something of my own, yeah. that's just up to you. Because and, and, and Justin might have separate points because we both DM'd 5e pretty heavily um, and likely have different styles. I'm familiar with Justin's. I don't think he's nearly as familiar with mine, though. For myself, I naturally just kind of go crazy with plot stuff more than magic items, so the lack of magic items uh, in the base book is not as... Uh, harmful to my dm style because if i really want stuff that goes beyond those i'll just tap resources like uh expansion books or reddit or anywhere else online for ideas what i like about 5e is the rules and the flexibility that you have as a dm there's enough governing skills that you can lump whatever type of action you want into it without getting super specific but there's still enough flexibility and things that you can kind of freestyle off of it without having your players look at the book and say, I have X, Y, and Z. I want this to mechanically work. We have a million things to keep track of. That, from what I've seen in 3.5 especially, but also a little bit ad and is problematic, is you have like so many options as a player presented to you that you can just become this total rules lawyer with telling the DM how the game should be run because we did account for that. It, that is in 3.5 or that is in, in ad and Whereas 5e is like, it falls under some blanket thing, talk to your DM. And then the DM can tell the story in a way that like allows them to do what they want but also makes sense so you're saying it's harder to be a rules lawyer in 5e than other editions yeah interesting i would like I would agree with that actually yeah like i totally get it um the thing that kind of that that's off-putting about that for me is that i feel ad and i have more flexibility because of the set rules because it allows me not to because like I, I can have one-on-one -on -one with my player. My player goes, I want to do this. I go, okay, well, this is what the rules allow of the world, and these are how we do the math percentage. You know, you probably you would have this percentage to do that. You would have to roll this and roll that. But I had a specific way to follow it where that gets really m muddy in 5e, and I feel like that can end in a ton of arguments with just maybe saying something wrong or saying it's going to fall under this blanket somewhere and let's try to figure it out, I can still see an argument happening with that player going, sure. well, there's more here, and this can fall here, where in ad and I feel like because of how the stats worked, because of the math and the rules that they had in place, um, there, it, there wasn't actually a lot of room to say uh, no and have the player like be very disheartened about the no because there was a solid reason why it was a no. Where in 5e, I can see, well, this would actually kind of work, you know, and, and I have this and I have that, and you add them together, and you could still say no because it doesn't fall under a blanket type thing or the DM just can't seem to make it work because there's not a specific something for it. And then I can just see that, that player being disheartened. I would like to reel us in a little bit because the next question is about the quality of the game's mechanics. Sure. Pretty much that's all that we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. So can we go back to the world building and storytelling aspect and just make a comment about that for each edition? Okay. Matt, I'm would you like to start? I'm gonna throw it out there that that honestly is the same exact amongst every edition. The fact that you can build your own world, you can tell your own story is the whole point of D&D. I think 3.5 and 5e have more pre-built modules if you don't want to go to those lengths. Mm -hmm. But I also think in both systems and in AD&D, &D, you can build your own world. Like, there's nothing stopping you in any system from building a world or from telling a story. So I, I want to comment on that a little bit. I want to talk about accessibility for 5e adventures and worlds. Um, they have the most number of pre-written adventures and worlds because a lot of the adventures take place in you know one of I believe four different worlds that exist within Wizards. <coughs> Where does those worlds start? Oh yeah, three five. <laughs> right, but they have been expanded upon in Five E, having more pre-written adventures. You also have a lot of resources at your disposal to help you create a world. Uh, you know, religion, uh, political systems, things like that. I'm sure three five is, but I'm only going to speak to five. Just hauling the book out right now, and <laughs> waving it at us menacingly. And I also want to speak to the earlier point about magic items. We also get magic items in every single adventure module that is printed with five e. Uh, so you can take 
the the base and then look at the 20 plus adventure modules that have been published nearly 20 to be if, fair if you want to throw out the number of supplemental modules with magic items you're losing this fight i'm <laughs> losing this fight hard. right but when you brought it up earlier oh. it was only referencing what was included in the base game i would like to point out that the amount of supplemental materials is not necessarily a positive point for your edition because that requires players to spend more money if they're not available for free online, which they're not because your edition is the newest, so a lot of those modules aren't going to be free online. So if we're talking about what players could have access to right now... Actually, anything yes, prior are... to 3, I believe, is not technically available online. It, a certain extent of it is through the Wizards system reference doc, but until Wizards got their hold on... Uh, uh, or I guess after Wizards got their hold on the D&D property, I believe everything fell under their IP and they don't publish all of that openly. They publish a certain extent of it, same with 5e. Okay, but, but it's still cheaper to access 3.5 and AD&D adventures than it is to access sure, yeah. 5e adventures. If for no I'm other saying, reason than the datedness of the book. Right, you make a good point that they're publishing new items in every new module, mm. but that costs the players more money in order to play those. They're not available in the base game. Does it, though? It costs the DM more to potentially get the module, but as long as they're providing the item descriptions to the player, the player doesn't need to spend anything. Well, we're talking about the benefits for the DM right now, so that's not that's a benefit yeah. for the DM. <laughs> that's, that's fair, but your point was but the players have to spend more, and one you're, player has to spend more. Well, you are the player, yes. Yeah. Players, DMs have to spend more, and I guess the players could help their DM supplement the costs if they were being nice. I don't know. <laughs> you just never had nice players, I guess. Well, <laughs> and then and then what I was going to say is, I know you guys are talking about, like, what is available that's already written. Um, that's great and all. That helps for people that don't want to actually create their own magic items and don't want to create their own type of baddies or whatever because you can choose from things. Um, I feel that in storytelling specifically for AD&D, they do give you a list of items that aren't in modules. They give you a, a wide list of them, of magical items, of just other type of weapons and things like that. But they also give you the ability to create your own magic item. Basically, they almost give you a formula for different things in AD&D. They go, well, if you add this and this and this, you're going to get a silver axe that has a plus two to hit and could do 25% cold damage. Like, it was just a really cool way to create things, and AD&D allowed you to do that. It showed you how things were created. It gave you, gave the, the, even the uh, ability for the DM to explain to players in character how your character could make these items. There are rules Three. for crafting magic items of 5e to the point where I, there's a whole page or two on crafting sentient ma magic items and how to give them personalities and bonuses based on those personalities and how they'd in fact the, uh, impact the players. I, I'm not trying to discount what's going on in, in AD&D for those, but it is something that's present it, in it every It is something edition, that is prevalent in yeah. every edition. Yeah. Like for our upcoming well, campaign, I've already crafted 30 magic items. Yeah. Right, right. And I, I understand that. I'm just saying that it hadn't been brought up yet, and that's one thing that I very much enjoy about AD&D, but you know, it, it kind of was the first place where it appeared. And I feel like, honestly, look, because I've, I've been able to look at the 3.5 ones, mm -hmm. and they're very similar to how AD&D does it. Gotcha. 5e is totally <clears throat> different. It's actually really different how you guys craft items, and I think it's because of the check process. I know you also have the check rolls, mm -hmm. but there, there, they're there was a prevalent. shift. They're not as There was a shift items. between 3.5 and 5, and I wonder if it happened in 4. So Dang, if only we had someone to debate. No, never mind. We no, don't no, 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 nobody from 4 is up now. We don't. We don't need that kind of <laughs> That was really impressive. <laughs> Wasn't that really good? What the hell was that? <laughs> That was the crickets from the 4E debate. Uh, that is team. simultaneously really cool and gonna haunt my dreams tonight. All right. <laughs> oh, what I also will say, though, and going back to, like, the rules. So not mechanics, but rules. Mm -hmm. I feel like because of the rules that are put in place in AD&D &D, and because of how a DM can create something that's very much their own and be able to have this wide availability in the world to let things slide, let things go... <clears throat> Instead of creating an A to B, creating all these tiny adventures within a large adventure, I think that cuts down on the something that we all dread, the bustability. AD&D allows people to create what they want, but allow the DM to comfortably use those characters throughout the world. There's a lot of leeway when it comes to things. Now, I have been busted really bad before. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that was my own decision. After talking a lot with with other dungeon masters about the whole situation, they were like, "Well, you know that there are things that are in check in AD and D for you to have not let that happen." And I was not made aware of those things until after the big incident. But I felt like it still it I, was because of a bard, and it says in AD and D that. DMs don't like have to allow bards, I and like I this, did. What? It does. It says in the book that well, it's Well, but I mean, like, master, in theory, DMs don't have to allow any, anything. You're I, a party of all things. I know, but I think, it's, it. I think it's great that in AD&D, if I go to the bard page, which is right literally... These um, players, you can especially tell them to fuck off. <laughs> basically, that's, like, what it did. Oh, I think they're the last ones in this. Thief... And I'm gonna say if there's a class that's so busted in AD and D that they have to give you a disclaimer. <laughs> it says that... a bard is an optional character class that can be used if your DM allows. <laughs> right there, it's the first sentence of a bard. If you have a class that's so busted, they have to give you an asterisk on it. That's not good for your bust ability. I created a new class <laughs> called Gun Nuker, and he's got guns and nukes, and he kills everybody. He's really hot, and he gets get all the. I you am. know what? Is bullcrap, though? Hmm. Double proficiencies. Bullshit. I think that 5e, having double proficiencies and things, and having these huge, like, pluses to your rolls, I can't speak for 3.5 because I don't know what the bonuses are like to rolls when you are when you have skills and they stuff. They can get bad if you do it right. But yeah. I think it makes players want to calculated, like, create a character with this calculated precision in order to DM bust. I think it encourages that, that in 5e. That said, also, aren't you guys the same ones that go to bat for the concept of rolling a nat 20 should always be something that's, like, superhumanly cool and a nat 1 should always be a yes. ridiculous failure? Yeah, those don't contradict. They do because... 5e accounts for things like your character just being good at stuff or like realistic things. It means that nothing you do is amazing because everything you do is really good. That's why it's really sad. It's really fun to have that moment of like, like that moment of serendipity, that moment of like chance. Oh my God, my character like so happened everything lined up great because of a chance I was able to do something great. The same thing with failing. Yes, your character probably would not actually stab your party member four times in a row. Okay? (laughs) I get that. That's why when a nat one happens, there's a way to roll to see if other things will happen. But if by chance that continues to happen, that's just how the dice roll. And that's what makes the game so fun. It really, it's that exciting, like, yes, I got a nat 20. Something really cool happens. Shit, I got a nat one, and I killed my partner. See, but I think that's something with, like, yeah, go ahead. I, I want to bring us back, because we're kind of getting off track from the, the bust ability. Well, I'm, I'm going to circle to a DM-related thing, at least, real quick. Okay, go um, for it. But, like, with that, when you roll those... I, for me, as a dungeon master, who is the person who is not solely responsible for the story, but, so like, responsible for governing the general flow of the story, ridiculous things like that, without being able to account for the players actually being naturally good at something, kind of can screw up the entire flow and feel just as, if not more, broken in a storytelling perspective. I get that they're really cool moments for the players, okay. and it's really neat, but at least from a storytelling perspective, things make sense. You can balance things more appropriately because you know there's no way that this... Uh, rogue is going to fail their dexterity check because they have a bajillion bonuses towards it. Like, even if they roll a one, they're going to get a ten, and I can count on the party looking to them to solve this problem. As opposed to, a one, they could die, and then we have to roll a new character. Game over. So, to speak to his, in 3-5, I don't know if it's, I don't remember if it's actually a core rule or if it's just one of the more popular homebrew rules. When you roll to crit, you then roll again to confirm your hit. Um... Some people do double crits, triple crits. I had a friend who was a level 14 death knight who was running... This was not a campaign I was involved in, but they played with the double crit, triple crit system. And he was killed by a village boy who threw a stone at him. Like, that completely throws the whole pace of anything you can account for as a DM when someone rolls three 20s in a row and all of a sudden a small village child can kill your level 14 death knight just like oh. right but stuff like that happens i'm not saying that a child like like somebody gets hit with a rock and dies but honestly they're still a living creature in a world that may have medical problems they can't be perfect mm-hmm. they m- the stone might have hit correctly on their temple to burst their artery and that was the end of them 
things like that happen and we need to account for that as a DM and I love that. I know that like at first I get a little salty because I'm like, great, they not, they crit, they double crit um, one of the what, devils that they were fighting. And so, you know, the battle was over before it begun, but it was really neat because this player, the way that we story told it, this player comes riding in with an ax, nicks its Achilles heel, it's huge, okay? And it falls from the pain and it impales itself with a statue through its neck and that's how it dies. It's really interesting, your argument, and I'm not like, legitimately it's a really interesting argument i feel because most of the time i would say that 5e has grounded itself in that regard it has found a way to like account for the realistic profession of your character if you're a level 10 thief or a level 10 fighter or something you're just naturally going to be good at certain things Fair. and you're not going to fail miserably but by your own argument here like Normally, I would view those things as they're ridiculous. They're outlandish. They're the type of things that would take this story from being like a realistic story um, and a realistic story in the sense of also a good story does away with the fact that at any point you could have a brain aneurysm and drop. Mm -hmm. Like, and your argument for that technically grounds it more in reality. <laughs> like, yes, freak things like that should happen or can happen. I personally, from a storytelling perspective, don't think they should. Never have I read a book or watched a TV show where halfway through the main character dies because they had a heart attack and that's just the end of the show now and now we're changing it. Um, to be like, fair. It's more realistic, the rest of the book kind of. Blank. But yeah, it's, it's 1,500 <laughs> blank pages. That's crazy. To be fair, she's not talking about, oh, well, you rolled in at one. I guess you're going to have a heart attack. She's talking about, oh, now the DM has to improvise a way to make this make sense in the story. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, that is better for the player, not for the DM. If mm -hmm. we're talking about benefits for the DM, that is harder unless... You're like Kimmy or other DMs who really enjoy that improvisation. I mean, and I do a degree of it. I still use a, a fumble and a nat 20 table, even though that 5e doesn't do that. But I cool. understand the benefit and the draw from rolling mm -hmm. a nat 20, and it just makes sense. Like, Or you roll a 1 on a skill check, and you don't See, shit I think, the See, I think it's just my st play style, which is why I think it's good, mm -hmm. is because my play style is I created a world for you guys to create your own story in. And this is you guys creating your own story in my world. I'm not dictating what should happen, what needs to happen. Yes, I have some things that I want you guys to do because I put time into it and made it really neat. But you guys are creating your own story. And I, as a dungeon master, love to see that flourish. And so I'm happy to do that. Matt, would you like to talk about um, the bustability of 3.5 real quick? No, I would not. <laughs> Okay. Because you can rules lawyer everything in 3.5. Easy like, to no. bust DMs in 3.5. That was, is what uh, it is. That was yeah. one of my things that I brought up during character creation. Sure. It's so fun to make these super awesome god killers. <laughs> yep. Okay. There you and go. And as a DM, like DMs lie awake in cold yeah. sweats <laughs> thinking about these god killers. Exactly. <laughs> My swashbuckler who can crit on a 12 is all of a sudden just awful when <laughs> you're the guy getting hit by it. But, that being said, if you're playing with... That's working with your character, working with your players. If you have one player who's got a min-max, it's awful. If you have five players who are going to min-max, you can deal with that. You bump the CR up three or four levels. So everybody's and broken, nothing's broken. Yep. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everyone can make their super fun characters that have all these crazy things that they can do. And as a DM, you can deal with it. It is awful when you have one person who min-maxes and, like, three people who don't. That sucks. And that's when you need to talk with your players. If you have an advanced, experienced player and a bunch of newbies, you just tell the experienced player during character creation... Create a normal character. You say, please, <laughs> create a please normal. no. Please, yeah, please play, no. Create someone that's really fun to role play and don't sit down in min max. And mm -hmm. if you have a decent group, and if you don't have a decent group, why are you playing? Because it's not fun. Mm -hmm. If you have a decent group, you can get rid of that problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Justin, did you want to say something before we move on to the next question? I do because I don't think five e bustability was actually addressed. We oh, mainly yeah. got preoccupied yes. you, with the nat 20 versus natural 1 discussion. Me? Sidetracked? You, what? Yeah. You did already right. earn the yeah. point. You earned the point. You, it was addressed. Make your you case said. anyway, man. Just hammer it home. Beat it to the ground. 5e is the least bustable system of the three. It, <laughs> thank, I, thank you. It, it, I, it, it, that. I mean, all of us Bat, agree. Do we even need to argue at this point? We're good. Continue on to the next question, please. Yep. Okay. Well, that brings us to question four. 
What is the quality of the game's mechanics? And y'all DMs, go. Uh, the mechanics in 3.5 are awesome. There's a ton of them. You can do whatever you want, and it's all accounted for. It's incredible. Lee, painful to keep track of. <laughs> you have I... a DM screen that keeps track of pretty much See, everything. Yeah, true. but my DM screen has four panels. Yours has like 50 to keep track of all the skills. It, it, it's like, like a box. Eight. <laughs> it's like a small house. You actually it, have to uh, go to rooms to look at the panel walls. I'm in my me... DM battle station with eight monitors. <laughs> to keep track of it gives me plenty of room to have all the character sheets and books I need behind it. All right, 5e, you can only have like one book open behind your dungeon screen. All right, I can have the dungeon master's guide, the player's handbook you know and two monsters. You, know you know what I'm hearing right now? I need a DM screen and three books to keep track of my system. <laughs> so I, I want to say though, I think AD&D, I think AD&D does the best of both worlds. They don't have too many guidelines, yeah. but they don't have like not, a, they don't have that blanket system either. They have very specifics and they have enough specifics for the players to understand why things happen and they have enough specifics for the DM to either uh, to either tell the story of a pre-written one or to build one themselves. Yeah. Um, and I, that goes into just some of the tables that they have. Um, I will say some of the things I think are very repetitive in 3.5, looking at a little bit. I feel like <laughs> I feel like you could take away some of your mechanics and it still would be okay. I feel like you could bring your four screen down to three. And I think it would be fine. Which like which ones are you talking? Because I mean, <laughs> which screen? <laughs> like, Wait, which I'm, one? Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious. Like, what are some examples of the ones you think that are repetitive? I mean, sometimes you have the same mechanic like on a magic weapon that you get from a train. That's advantage. what I'm saying. That's what, what I'm saying is I I can see like when you go into your feet and there's a few mechanics on how this will work for a character's throw. Yeah. It's it's going to be the same thing as if you picked up a weapon or a magical or like or sorry an enchanted or whatever yeah. piece of armor or something like that. That is the same across the board where I feel like it doesn't need to be written that much. It do, you don't need to have those four screens because so, in AD&D it kind of puts things together. Like if it's going to do this, if it's going to do damage and it's going to do some type of, some like if it's going to do damage, the type of damage or how it's given, it kind of falls into this. So weapons, like magical items, weapons, armor, and um, skills learned falls into that list. So in 3.5, there's, on the DM screen, most of that type of stuff you're talking about is condensed onto, like, one table. And, and what the hell is all of it? <laughs> so the reason a lot of two times, of, <laughs> one, two of those pages are how to grapple someone. <laughs> okay, we, we need to talk about the grappling system. We will, system. we will. No, don't worry. Don't I got to talk about the you. grappling system. Because it's awful in every, I don't know about AD&D. Five it's, is real simple. It's yeah. a straight contest. Done. <laughs> But then what happens once you're grappled? You can't move. <laughs> but what options do you have available? Attack or try and get away. <laughs> what about the grappler? Move them. Or? Your hands are busy. <laughs> but you can move them. I don't know. I still think the grappling system and all the systems is not. If great. you guys don't know what the grappling system is in 3.5, just Google <clears throat> grappling system. 3. Grappling 5 system. You're open right to now. an opportunity attack while attempting. If you hit, then you yep. fail. Make a melee touch attack to see if you grab them. Make another grapple check to see if you hold them. There's a calculation to solve this. A d20 plus your base attack roll plus your strength modifier plus a special size modifier for different types of creatures ranging from a plus 16 for colossal down to a negative 16 for a tiny fine little creature, which I assume is a grain of sand that you're grappling. To be uh, uh, from there, just... there's about <laughs> two pages worth of contingencies that could theoretically throw off your grapple check. I did some research on grappling specifically That's... to dunk on 3.5, but, uh... <laughs> Hot Just damn. throwing it out there, grappling's not great in 5e either. <laughs> How many times have you used it in your campaign? I don't play 3.5, no, mainly because I'm scared five. of grappling. Five. Oh, um, no, never except for the time that I built a pro wrestler with the express purpose of only grappling in combat, in which case I used it a lot. <laughs> How did it go? I strangled an orc commander to death. Oh, that's well, pretty badass. It was pretty okay. rad. His name yeah. was Chef Kevin, and all he wore was you... a apron and wielded a frying pan did you only use like one um equation to figure out if you'd strangle him or not? yeah it's called roll a strength contest this is my equation i love um, it that's 5e um <laughs> i believe there are a disadvantage and advantage for size in 5e as well yeah i think it's if it's like two sizes bigger yep. than you or something mm -hmm. then you're at disadvantage or same in the opposite not direction really. but anyway i will agree grappling is a little out of hand in three five yeah 
we all, I can't say much about grappling in AD&D because grappling is a little different in AD&D. It's actually less than 5e. It's just a strength check and then it's storytelling. Mm -hmm. So if you are stronger than that character, say I grab the character by the arm, what I would do at, just to help with the mechanics of the game is I would make you make a strength check and I would see if the person could beat it. Um, or if you were grabbing while a person was moving, it would be strength versus dexterity. Can mm -hmm. that person get away from you? And then if you do grab them, then it's a strength check every round to see if you hold them and what you do. So your homebrewed version of grappling for AD&D is effectively what 5e's version is, other than the dex check for moving. Right, and the only reason that comes in is because I have the ability to storytell. If you, this person is like, I'm going to grapple this super fast character mm -hmm. while it runs by me, well, I need you then at that point... To not only make a strength check, but you're going to have to make a dexterity check, and it's going to be, have to be better than this person's dexterity. Yeah. Because that person's running, you're moving, they're obviously faster than you, but you need to be able to not only hold them, but keep them. Or mm -hmm. grab them, but keep them. And I, that's what I like about AD&D is, again, there's still rule sets in here for when a character wants to do something that is not like attack, loot, something very specific, they are storytelling, they're like, yeah. I want to do this instead of just attack with my hammer. I have everything I need right here without it being well, over the Well, that said, though, this is not a debate on your ability to homebrew rules on top of something. Like, unless it's explicitly something that's not covered by the book. If it's there's not, grappling rules in the There's not book, grappling then, rules in here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, grappling didn't come about until 3. Yeah. And then 3.5 really, sorry. <laughs> no. We've been there. So I want to speak just kind of generally on 5e uh, mechanics. They're not going to be as detailed um, as 3-5. That's a nice word for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and be nice. I'm going to try and be general here. I don't think um, anything is as detailed as 3-5. So. <laughs> More correct. That's because your right. systems aren't and, as good. And I, I think that makes it better for the player as far as understanding game mechanics. It also allows when things aren't as detailed and minute down to the, the very menial actions that can disrupt a, a check Mm -hmm. um, it allows for the rule of cool to enter, uh, which is just, you know, it's GM style. Like, you don't have to go rules as written if somebody says something that they want to try and then you think it's cool. Like, mm -hmm. hey, go for it. That allows you some, some flexibility while also, like, hey, we want to apply this set and gives you as a DM some vague reasoning as to why you're going to implement the rules that you are for what your player is trying to do. Um, I think just the general openness of a lot of the mechanics uh, allows for that a lot better than some of the more strict guidelines yeah. that are I would even in. say, I'm going to say 5e, I think mechanics still are a little... They're, they're more detailed than AD&D, but I think they're detailed in the wrong direction when it comes to allowing players to feel like they can do, or tr not do, they can attempt anything as a character. Um, I've seen it difficult where a character wants to do something very cool, but then the DM is struggling like, okay, is it going to be this kind of check? Is it going to be this kind of check? I got to say why it's this kind of check, where a and d doesn't have that. They have... It's DM's discretion as long as the, you know, and a lot of times that's where the percentage die comes in. That's when you roll a D100 and you have charts that you work with. Now, not everything is pre-written on a D100. Yes, I get that you guys have the same thing with your D20s. You can roll, have tables. But there's something about... Have D100 tables. No, I know you have D100. Oh, you do too. I'm just saying in general. This is like, a pre-existing yes. discussion <laughs> yeah. based yeah. on D100. But, I, what, but what I'm saying is, I'm just saying that I feel like the, the, the rules are very well... They're set, but they're also allowing for that openness for a character to really feel like they can do what they want instead of sticking to what their character knows. I only have these. These are what I'm proficient in. These are the checks I can make. This is what my character should be doing. Where I feel like in AD&D, my character might be good at these things, but he's also this kind of guy. So he would still try to do this. He'd probably fail. Um, there's a percentage roll for no, it. You, you can do that, that, do that in 5e five five. or 3.5. Yeah, you can do that yeah. in every edition. Just because you're not good at it doesn't mean you can't I know, but I'm it. saying, like, I feel like because I'm staring at checks and I have put so much time into what proficiencies I'm going to do in these checks, it doesn't, it just, it slips your mind. Because you're, you've got it now with these specific think, mechanics so to follow. In real life... The person who I'm doing tech support for is not going to try to fix a switch or fix a router because they don't have that proficiency. They could. That's something they could if they take, they could try it, but they would fail. 
I'll stick some peanut butter Just, in there. I mean, <laughs> as you get butter. better as a thief, you're going to be better at sneaking. As you get better as at smithing, mm. you're going to be better at smithing. And that is an AD&D as well. I'm saying the mechanic of the checks, since they don't exist and it's a different type of check, you're not putting points into certain things. I think what Kimmy is saying, and I agree with this, is that the way the character sheets are laid out... It encourages players to only make checks they're good at because they can see, oh, I'll get a plus seven in this. Oh, I have a zero in this. I'm not even going to try to make that check. Whereas because that's not sitting in front of the players in AD&D, they're more willing to try anything. Yeah. This is not saying you can't do those things. Mm -hmm. It's just what the players are going to be encouraged to do because of what's sitting in front of them. And I could just like in real life, though, I'm not going to try to ride a horse because I'm terrible at it. Like, yeah, but as there's... you more and more horses, you so get better I, at it. Like That's your, your why point... you would choose to ride a if horse. If a troll sure. was chasing you, though... Yes, I would try to jump on a horse right. just like I but would that's a last in 3.5e. Yeah. And I, I would be far worse at it than an equestrian. I right. just had, a in my last session that I ran, a paladin try and, and do some crazy acrobatic rope work over a 400-foot drop. He is not proficient in acrobatics, <laughs> but he had to do it because that's all he wanted but, to do and okay. could do. You, well, you just said he had to do it. Is that true? Or was this something like he just randomly had this idea and was like, I'm going to try to do this? He didn't this. randomly have the idea. He put himself in a position where that was the solution. Um, like, unless he could come up with something better. But the that. position he was in plus the solution he proposed required mm-hmm. an acrobatic Now, check. Now, think about that in AD&D. He, being pushed into scenarios, you're going to have to make solutions that are there. Yeah. But not being pushed in a scenario, you still have that ability to be like, you know, my, what would my character do? What could help the party? It's it's that that but I think middle that you ground. Can, you could still do that, but realistically, if I am not forced into a situation, when I think what could I do, I'm not going to think what am I bad at and try it anyway. No, but I'm gonna you think, think what can I do within my proficiencies to execute and assist yeah, like, the party. Well, but you'd also have to think about just what is happening around you and what would your character do. It it it's really easy for your character to talk to people a certain way or walk into certain things, but if you're not like if a character really wanted something, but they're not proficient in sneaking, they're not going to go after it if they see, oh, I have a zero in sneak, or I have a zero in, you know, my dexterity I've proficiencies. I've never experienced that in a campaign. I've had players who, if they wanted to do something and no one else in the party was like, no, I'm not going to go sneak and get that for you. They'll try it if they want it. Players, and players, I love you, players are really dumb. And they'll just do <laughs> <some> dumb stuff. <laughs> like, Let's... you can count on that in any edition. Fair enough. Let's talk about the balance of the mechanics very quickly, and then let's move on to the final question, because we are running out of time. Sure, gotcha. So balance, the way I would kind of define that is how even are all of the different classes and races, and how balanced are the mechanics for different players? Okay, 3.5 doesn't get to talk, because I've read through a lot. And he's over here grinning. There's no balance in 3.5, so you just don't get that. I one. still want to hear him, though. <laughs> it's, so the reason there is no balance in 3.5 is because you very rarely just play a fighter. You play a fighter cross-classed with something else. You and play Drizzt sudden... in every character. <laughs> you <always> Drizzt. <laughs> Aww, I love Drizzt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, but, like, you cross-class. You tend to cross-class a lot, which means that, no, there is no, like, the base classes are all pretty much balanced. Wizards start out terrible and end up being probably a little bit better than everybody else, but for the first four or five levels, playing a wizard is awful. It's the same in AD&D. Magic users are exponential, exponentially yep. growing. And it's the same in 5e. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's the same there, and I think that's just really well across D&D how yep. mages and magic users should work, because by the but, time they're 12, they're more OP than a level 12 of anybody else. But, I mean, all the base classes are all extremely comparable. If you have a team of people all just using base classes... They're going to outclass each other in certain areas. The rogue's going to be better at sneaking. He's going to have right. lockpicking. He's going to have more skills. Hmm. See, I disagree. I think the base classes in 5e are not comparable. No, I, I'm not talking about 5e. He's talking about 3.5. I'm talking 5. about 3.5. Yeah, oh, no, fair 5e enough, fair is enough. Yeah. not even I thought, close. I thought you were saying across the board, no. all editions. I was like, nope. no. I'm just going to preface this before she goes any farther. Jamie's got a vendetta against monks in 5e. <laughs> I am 
playing a monk in 5e right now, and they suck until Monks higher levels. have nothing against the one barbarian class that takes half damage from everything at level 4. For real, barbarians and rogues in 5e are fucking busted, and you cannot tell me that those classes are not more powerful than a ranger or a monk at low levels. powerful in different ways. But I know, no, 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 here's the thing, here's the thing, here's the thing. I agree, and the reason I'm agreeing with her is because a lot of the pre-written modules that you play in 5e, and a lot of times how people homebrew, those characters always have advantage. Now, if you were to find a module or a homebrew where being a, being a half-giant or being a rogue was a negative, then maybe it would balance out. But when you guys are, like, sneaking through dungeons or fighting large monsters, of course those characters are going to outrank everybody else. I'm actually not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm saying create, what? create a story where... Everything, everybody has to be equal, and there's no advantage to being a rogue in it. There's no, like, well, there's always acrobatic and sneak checks. I don't think that is because of the modules. I just think that's built into the character creation. Rogues get double proficiency. Rogues can do all of these things that other characters can't do because they're supposed to be, quote-unquote, jack-of-all-trades, sort of. Mm -hmm. I just think that they are way more powerful than they are in AD&D. &D. I personally think that... AD&D has the most balance, but maybe I'm a little biased. I don't know. I think they are truly different. They're built for different things, and therefore they are more balanced. A wizard will have negatives against them, um, where a rogue or a fighter will have positives for the same check, and I think that is more balanced in AD&D versus in 5e when you create a character. There are some classes that are recommended People don't play because they can't do certain things and they're not as strong as other classes. Can we talk about the bard in AD&D that we just brought up a little bit ago <laughs> and has a massive asterisk? Of so the reason, I will, I'll talk about the bard. Right. The re Real quick. The reason why the bard has a, ma uh, a a huge asterisk is because everybody wants to play a bard, but where does the bard fall under? The bard was not actually technically a, a class created Who in AD&D. Who wants to play a bard? bard? I want to meet these people. Uh, my brother. That's all he plays. Oh, a lot of people want to play a bard because you, it's Nick. a funny meme. True. I'm going to seduce the monster. But they don't think about the fact that they can't wear armor and they can't, they don't have weapon proficiency. They can't do damage. So they are there as a support class. But also, correct me if I'm wrong, in 5e, aren't they like able to fight? I mean, they can. Not yeah. super well, but yeah. they can. Probably yeah. better than an AD. AD&D, yeah, they, yeah, AD yeah. they can't. So it, I think it took Nick to get to level 12 to actually do damage. I think it did. He, it he took did, him a really long time. He did one damage the entire campaign. Yeah, the campaign lasted no, so long. you say long. one damage, you mean one instance of damage, which is no, a singular point No, he did point one of point of damage, <laughs> and he celebrated impressive. about it with a song. Bard. Anyway, but the point of the Bard in AD&D is they had to put the like. Bard underneath a rogue. And so there was a lot of things that are up to the DM's discretion about being a bard in AD&D. I will say AD&D, I think, is the most balanced when it comes across the board onto character creation. It's the most balanced with weapons. It's the most balanced when it comes to fighting. I feel like the way that the mechanics work and how each character is different, each race is different, and how it says certain races can't be certain classes, that is balance. I understand you want to play this race and this class and this class and and have it all work out. That's great. But then, like in 3.5, you get god killers. That's oh, not balance. That's also not for the sake of balance. That was for the sake of narrative in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, it creates also creates balance. It's I, actually Actually, I'd argue I'm that gonna, it doesn't. It, yeah. it pushes people to be more unbalanced, it, which yeah, I guess technically balances things by having everybody be broken. But like, if you wanted to really balance it, you wouldn't let players play a Goliath as a barbarian because you're just going to be jacked on strength way more than anybody else that's using strength stuff. I was going to say, you... most of the things that sounds like they cut out are things that would be terrible ideas. Like in 3.5, yeah, you can make a half-orc rogue. You're taking <laughs> negatives to everything a rogue is supposed to be I, good at, but you can make it. a half orc rogue. I don't see the problem here. It's fun. It's wow. It's fun. <laughs> I don't see the problem. Hey, what were you gonna say? <laughs> I was going to counter James's point about everybody being broken and therefore nobody is broken. I disagree. I don't think the powers and abilities in A D and D are as strong as they are in five E, and so your characters aren't really broken because they can only do a set number of things compared to all of the feats and abilities you can get in 5e. 
So you can have a character who is very good at something. That doesn't mean their character is broken. It means that your dwarf fighter is really strong, just like your barbarian um, Goliath. But I don't think that makes the dwarf fighter broken. I think that balances the elf sorcerer, who mm. is very good at magic, and but doesn't have any ability to fight whatsoever because they have a really crappy armor class. So, like, the party members have to kind of work together. Speaking of which, at some point with mechanics, we do need to talk about Thacko being a thing. Because that's some BS. No, but... Thacko is not BS. Thacko is the best thing Thacko's... that has ever come out of Dungeons and Dragons. Whoa! <laughs> Categorically I'm just kidding, false. I'm just okay. I think there's a kidding. reason it was left behind. No, so the, th- the this is what I'll just I'll just touch on Thacko real quick, but I'm not going to go into it too deep. It's not as I'm not as passionate about the B100 in the in the tables that I am as Thacko. But the point of Thacko is it allowed a net. This is what I say. It allowed a nat twenty to feel like a nat twenty, and allowed a one to feel like a crit one. The reason I'm saying that is because to hit. You, you you because of how you had to subtract armor class from your hit it allowed all of the hit ranges to fall within 1 in 20 so when you rolled a nat 20 it really felt special it felt like yeah i totally hit this character there's nothing that can defeat me right now where it takes like in 3.5 and 5e it takes that away it takes away the fact that a nat 20 is the highest you can roll like, that is why a nat 20 is so wonderful in AD&D. A nat 20 in, in, D in, in 5e, just by the core book, is it's a hit. Yeah, like, a done. No, I, I get that. But rogues over here are rolling 26 and 27. Like, it's nobody's business. Yeah, it's called a dirty 20 mm. or, you know, whatever. But it's, it's filthy. It's filthy. <laughs> well, but, but there could but be armor classes away. that are higher exactly. than that. Like, a, yeah. a Tarasque is massive and yeah. a... Even a 26 on him, you might contact, but it's not going to do enough right. damage to draw blood. And the same thing is in a- AD&D with Thacko. Instead of just adding things on top so numbers get above 20, they're subtracting things to keep them within that 20 hit range to make a 20 very special. That you can't roll above that. Okay, but, but this is also going to go into our comprehension point about mechanics. Thacko is, you, you can't argue that it's harder to understand than, hey, my number beats this, yes or no. I'm not going to argue that at all. I'm going to tell you the reason why Thacko, even though it is a bit and more that, work, it, it, it there's a bigger payoff when it comes to rolling it's, a It's about the message that it delivers as a number, but I think that on the flip side, it's harder to comprehend the payoff for the number that it delivers does not outweigh the complication of it when you can have a system like 5e um, that just sets skill checks generally higher a nat 20 is rare and still will be a hit no matter what but like generally the skill checks can be higher and if you're fighting something with an armor class of 25 or 30 you know as a player like oh dang this thing's really strong so So we spend enough of our time playing doing math and i think the quicker that you can get that done Mm -hmm. and get to the results is more rewarding to the players for sure than anything else i will say Obviously, there is math in every edition of AD and D. Five E is just more adding. I'm trying to figure out this plus this plus this, and there's no subtraction. Usually, unless you are making a check in which you have a negative modifier, and then AD and D is a little bit of subtraction. But when we were playing AD and D every week, I don't think anybody had trouble calculating their Thaco. I think. Well, well, you, you suck! <laughs> no, no, no. And the, I think that's fair. No, no, no. Great Here's debating. the thing. You <laughs> hadn't... You jumped into it after playing 5e and had to get used to it. Once you're used to it, you can play it just fine. Right, it only I... takes a few sessions. Whereas when we, like... If we were to go back to it now, yeah, it would take a while to get used to. But I don't think people who play the edition regularly have trouble calculating their Thacko. As someone who's never played AD&D, the fact that you just said, yeah, it might take a few sessions to get used to, means that that is not a good rule. But it also takes a few sessions to get used to all the pluses that you have to remember to add to your rolls in 5e. I'm going to be honest. There you, are things in 5e. Roll, look at sheet, done. No, no, no. 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 There, no. Is, there is... 
No, they're Shit. all over the place. There's a bunch of things you have to add up. There's way more to remember and keep track of in 5e than in AD&D. The only I, number you should ever be adding is what's on your sheet in one spot. I no, 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 no. I watch no. him all the time when he plays that that Goliath whatever barbarian. He's like because oh. he's activating additional abilities. Exactly, right. which does which is not in every class in 5e pretty much <laughs> you activate a special. But we're talking abilities. about a base roll without additional abilities. Okay. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, but you realize that Thacko is the only role that you make that is like that, where everything else, whether it's base or not in 5e, you still have to add and do math. And there's never just a base role when it comes to 5e, especially after level 4. You are now adding two or three things on top of your 20 role. You have your proficiencies. You have your proficiency bonus. You have your bonuses in your stats. Which you have all should be tracked bonuses. in the, the damage roll and the hit roll on your weapons table. That's already there, there, but there's already two. And then you have to add in your proficiencies that you should be keeping track of every level that you. If you're if you're managing your character sheet properly based on the one that's published, all of those should already be summed up in the one slot on your weapon list yeah. like in the center of there's the page. not a slot for it there's a line for your weapon and it says your weapon's name plus to hit which should be your modifiers all added together what the plus is then the damage and that's on that's on the ad and d sheet as well too when you're especially and especially against it even tells you whether you're finding medium or large you're saying the math is harder because of thaco we're saying yeah when you're rolling to hit it's harder but there aren't as there's not as much math. There aren't as many checks that you have to do math for in AD and D compared to Five E. So the amount of math you're doing is the same. Just because it's harder to do the math to hit, doesn't mean that there is more math overall in the addition I think than in Five E. But in a combat, math. that is what bogs down play. Barely, barely. I have DM'd AD for so or AD and D for so long, barely. Does it bog down play? Because you're not doing the math. I am as the DM. I, a DM should be able to th calculate Thacko instantly. And I love it. Having played AD&D for so long and 5e for so long, combat takes the same amount of time. Yeah, it really does. It takes the same amount of time. Because when people are playing in 5e, there are a lot more abilities to keep track of as well. So people are deciding what they want to do on their turn. Combat takes the same amount of time. You know, and I, I see that when we play, because when we play AD&D, &D, I'm the one that calculates Thacko real quick. I say, what do you roll? They tell me I roll a 17. I go, that doesn't hit. Well, the next player rolls an 18. I go, ooh, that hits. Everybody knows that they got to roll an 18 or higher. Or somehow get pluses to an 18. Oh, but you can same make that same no, decision in 5e. That's what I'm it. saying. Same thing happens in 5e. So why is Thacko worse than your D20? Because it's harder to calculate for a newer player. Come out. So I guess like we should be judging mechanics, in my opinion, based on how accessible they are for a new player, not a veteran player. Because you can get good at anything over time. You can learn how to do it and, and get really quick at calculating Thacko after years of playing. But if I sat a character sheet down in the mechanics in front of a new player, how quickly they can pick that up should be what we're judging the mechanics, difficulty, and accessibility based on. Can you show on. me Thacko? Yeah, how do you calculate I've never Thacko done, right now? Okay, As well, someone who's never done AD&D... &D, how quickly can I understand that? While you are looking that up yes. to show Matt, mm -hmm. I will just say, when I was a new player learning AD&D, &D, I don't think it took me very long to get Thacko. It, it does take a little bit to get used to when you haven't played the edition for a while, but it took me multiple tries of playing 5e to even get a sense as a new player for what needed to be added up every time I do a check or an attack or anything because there's so much information to keep track of. I think I agree with you. Thacko is definitely harder to keep track of than your to hit an armor class in 5e. I agree with that. I'm not making that argument, even if Kimmy is. Thacko is more complicated than the armor class system in 5e, mm -hmm. hands down. But if your argument is, well, it causes more math and it bogs stuff down, I disagree because there is still more to keep track of as a new player in 5e than in AD&D. AD&D is a simpler game. The only thing that is complicated about AD&D as a new player is that go. And if that math is the thing that is keeping you from being able to play AD&D, then you're probably going to struggle with 5e for a while as well, unless you have a DM that's just kind of letting you do whatever. I played AD&D with you guys for months, and by the end of it, 
still didn't know what I was rolling. Maybe you're just bad at math, honey. I'm terrible at math, <laughs> but that does not well, then take I away I'd also say you keep point. complaining about the math in 5e, so maybe you're bad at math. Maybe I am. There's a but... reason she's an English teacher. Maybe we're all bad at math here. Uh, you can... No, 3.5 no. has enough math. I am a fucking math magician. <laughs> is that a class? Magician. Is that a playable class? Probably. Here? I'll have to get some of the It's in one of the expansions. Yeah, uh, it's in one of the math magician. Section. Well, it doesn't... I use number yeah, there's, right. a, there's a section on there. No, I'm, I'm in the section. No. Nope. Yeah, calculating FACO. Okay. Yeah, that's the section. That's why I put it to this page so you can read that. It's going great. So, FACO stands for Chance to Hit Armor Class Zero. Zero. Chance to Hit starts with a T. The chance to hit. So I think it's two hit it's armor two class. Hit. Two yeah. hit armor yeah. class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's all right. Two I'm hit just giving armor hard class time. zero. So the the point of it is, um, you are going to subtract an armor class from your roll. So if you roll a fifteen, but they have an armor class of right, am I doing that right? I have not played in so long. You don't even remember it, and you're that for this edition right now. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, you add, you add. Game it's over, adding. mark it, mark it. No, 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 it's Let's adding, go. it is adding, it is adding. So you add, I got it, it's, so you add their armor class to your roll, which is why you want a negative armor class. If your FACO is 12, in order to hit someone with an armor class of zero, you have to roll a 12. Chance to hit, or two hit, sorry, two hit armor class is zero. Mm -hmm. So your FACO is what changes, but armor class can also change, but more rarely than in 5e. Very much. Your armor class is totally dependent on magical modifiers and armor. Okay. Not skills, not your stats. I mean, that has something to do with it, but not, like, your stats can change in 5e more fluidly as you level up than they can in Right. In so re re repeat the formula again. For so me. two hit armor class zero. Yeah. Means that if your Thacko is 12, if their armor class is zero, you have to roll a 12. Okay. So if their armor class is negative one, you have to roll a 13. 13. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if their armor class is one, you only have to roll an 11. Now, that requires a calculation for what? every single enemy that you fight. You have to recalculate your, your Thacko and figure no, out your what... your Thacko is also... Okay, I'm sorry. You have to no. recalculate what you need to roll in order to hit this creature. Wait, during a fight? Single... You no. have to do that in 5e2. 5e2. No, you don't. 5e gives you the armor class for the enemy. You have your armor class. You roll above it. That's all you have to do. There's no calculations other than adding one number to your dice roll. It, no, it's the same. There's, a, there's, a, there's an armor class for the enemy. Mm -hmm. There's an armor class for your player. Both... The enemy and the player have Thacos, and both the enemy and the player have armor classes. And basically, they're just contesting each other every time they right, attack. Right, because when I roll my hit, I go, what number do I need to meet or beat? And the DM tells me. It's the same thing with Thacko. The only difference is you guys can have armor classes of 25 and 30. No, it's not, it's not the same, though, because every new enemy that's introduced to combat, not every single attack that's made, but every new enemy that's introduced to combat, like a new enemy type that has a different armor class potential, you have to recalculate what you need to roll in order to figure out what they you're need not, to You're not... I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. If I fight in 5e, if mm -hmm. I fight a... Troll. Yeah. And I roll my first one and I go, what do I need to beat? The DM can tell me you need to beat a 12. Well, I, I rolled a 13. Okay. And then say the next guy I fight is and an ogre. And I'm like, what do I need to roll to be an ogre? That's still changing what I have to roll. The same thing is applied. But in that info was immediately presented to you with the enemy as opposed to needing to calculate it out with each enemy that's introduced. You do one calculation. What? Like, the DM never tells you what the armor class of your enemy but the is DM before knows you it. hit. But the DM knows it. The DM knows it. The DM it. doesn't have to calculate anything right out the gate. So, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to keep track as a DM if you want to keep track of all the Thacos. You have to know all your characters. I just say, what's your Thacko? That's it. What's your Thacko? While we're playing, at the beginning of the round, what's your Thacko? That don't hit. What's your Thacko? That don't hit. What's your Thacko? That don't hit. That sounds terrible. Yeah. It's really because not. Because you end up looking at Thacko, then dice roll making a calculation, and then determining whether or not it hits. That's the convolution yeah, I was gonna of the say, system. 3, 5, and 5e, e, you just, what'd you roll? All right, you hit. What'd you roll? Like you. I see what you're saying, but again, I'm going to make the point, in 3.5 and 5e, e, you take away the beauty of a d20. By making these hit throws higher, no, with the ability I, of higher than I, 20. 3, 5, and 5e e both still have you crit on 20. I'm going to be... I'm not saying you, you don't. You crit, but it's not as big of a deal... 
Why is it not as big as If a I deal? roll a 24, it's still not a crit because I rolled an 18 I'm gonna with be, a plus 6. I'm going to be the referee here. It's, yeah. We've spent like it's 15 minutes talking about Thacko. Let's walk it back and do something else. If you guys are interested on the differences between combat systems, Google Thacko. Google 5e <laughs> armor class. Figure it out. You'll get as confused as we are right now. <laughs> I think, yeah, Up to at this point, it's up to the listeners. Yeah. So let's go ahead and move on to the final question. And I'm actually going to specifically go category by category so that we don't spend as long on one thing this time. Sure. Question number five. How accessible is this edition for new players? Fair. We addressed it briefly. Let's start with character. How easy is it for a player to create a new character in 5e Go? Super easy. You go to D and D Beyond, and you can create a free character for Five E. So you need the internet. Wow, Kim. You, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How are you gonna access A D and D material without the internet if you don't already own it? Actually, I, I harder. To, you have a book. Not everybody has you a book. have a preprinted binder. I, I have a preprinted binder that I give my players. All right. So the next question, question six, is how accessible is this for Kimmy? <laughs> Matt, how accessible is it to, for a new player to create a character in 3.5? I will say it is harder to make a character in 3.5 than it is in 5e. 5e, you sit down, you pick your class, there's one table that you look at, you're done. Has a lot of recommended stuff, too. Yeah, you don't have to pick feats, you don't have to worry about weapon and armor proficiencies. It is easier for a new character to make someone in 5e, but it's also way more boring. No you. <laughs> God. I will say it's very easy to make a new character in AD&D. There aren't any convoluted like class and race and subclass things that you have to think about. The question was how accessible. Oh, how accessible to not, get into not, not how easy. Players. I though accessible. I do I do think the easy materials players. are free on the internet. So yes, it's accessible. Oh, okay, so we do need internet. Just to clarify. <laughs> Checkmate. Which is fine, but I do everything think is for AD and D is though. out there. I don't know why Kimmy said Well because oh, I'm saying everything for AD and D is out there and not everything is free for five E or three point five. But point. to be fair, yes, they have the D and D beyond. You can make a character, okay. but not everything that's in the player's handbook is free on D and D Beyond. That is true. But the question was but how easy is it to make easy. a character, not how easy it is it to make a tabaxi artificer in 5e. <laughs> right. But in in AD&D, how easy is it for a brand new character to pick up the system and create a character? Because, like, I can, I can create a 3-5 character in, like, a minute. Yeah, but that's oh, I create, I, create, I create an NPCs in, in a minute or two constantly. Yeah, it's very easy. how easy for a new player? It's so easy, easy for a new player to create a character. There aren't as many options, first of all, so it's faster and easier for a, new, a player that's totally new to D&D. If I were first introducing somebody to D&D who didn't want to be overwhelmed by the amount of choices, AD&D for sure. This is, like, somebody who's interested in fantasy, probably, like, an older person. Like an older person, I would introduce them to AD and D because there aren't like all of these crazy races and classes and all of these other things. We've introduced a lot of friends who aren't even super into like fantasy role play stuff to AD and D, and they picked it up just fine and enjoyed it immensely. I do agree that in Five E, it's easier for people who love D and D to make a character, make a new character, like if they're new to the game because they have D and D Beyond. And the rules are very, like, straightforward and laid out there. But in AD&D, the only complication in character creation is Thacko. Everything else is easier because there aren't as many complications. Think, everything's I laid out pretty clearly. Gonna, like, as, it walks you through it. There's been I literally five editions told you, worth I more. literally said that. As the clear loser in this situation, <laughs> 5e is not hard to make a character at all. 5e mm -hmm. is incredibly it's easy. It's not to hard to make a character in AD&D. It's not. All right. So how about this? 3.5 sucks, am I right, guys? <laughs> False. Yes. Our character creation is way more fun because you guys are just like, I'm going to pick this barbarian and I'm done. It's fun if you like math. It's boring. Okay. Exactly. Let's talk about cost. All right. 3.5 is going to get a point in this one because everything is online for free. Yes. Everything. All the base materials, yes. Yes. Everything is free for 3.5. And how much? I assume AD&D. AD&D as well. Yep. You can go, what is that, Dragon's Foot? Is that where I don't remember where we all got it? No, it's all um, it's all free. It's all free for AD and D and three point five. Sure. Except for if you prefer to have physical dice. That yep. said, I will toss something out there that I see more regularly. Older editions accidentally introduce homebrewed stuff uh, under the guise of it being actual published material. We're talking cost. We're just talking cost. Well, but I'm saying like it. it 
you it's all free which is great and it's accessible which is great because it's all free online but that also comes with the caveat of anybody can put anything out there and you can misconstrue it as okay legit. it's not that hard you just look for the sea yeah, wizards every, of the coast on right. the pdf it's not that hard every site out there also has like tags for homebrews because like three five has a lot of wikis and stuff mm -hmm. like that where you can look up anything and it's super easy to find the information anything homebrew is tagged on there now the next point is popularity 5e is obviously going to get the point for popularity. Oh, yeah. Let us, let us make a quick statement about cost, at least, so we've made... Well, hold on, You're not hold getting on, a point on. for cost. We don't well, need you. You're not going to decide that yet. Moving on. Moving on. No, you guys won the popularity in this. Just, we all know. It costs more to Stranger play 5e. Stranger Things. Done. I don't think it, well, hold on, I don't, I don't think it costs more to play 5e, period. It costs more to get all of the materials for 5e, sure, yes, I will yield. Yes, that's but in order to play, you have to no, get the materials. No, no, you can pay zero dollars and play 5th edition. The yeah. system reference doc is published. You can play an entire campaign of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons on any sort of online accessible, like you can go into Roll20, a vast majority the of the monster manual, accessible. A vast majority of the player options, accessible. You can go in and get all of those things. They're published for free because fifth edition wizards was like we're gonna be big boss dogs of the of the tabletop games so they're like free base rules and then they'll just pay us for the expansions so well, like you can play all the base rules for free with 5e but i do yield expansion material you do have to pay for it. fair enough i still can't think i can't think that you earn a point in this situation when 3.5 and AD and D are well is the metric to prove free. that it's free or is the metric so, to prove it's freer than you what's the best oh. the best option for cost for new players for cost for new players if we're going to completely disregard online material you will end up why paying... are we no why are we disregarding online material we just, just use online, online though right, right. for character no, creation I, i'm moving into a yeah. new example i'm moving into a new example here with printed material with printed material if we're going to look at that i say it's on almost even footing because what are you going to pay for an AD and D second edition Dungeon Masters manual? Fifteen dollars, correct? At a used bookstore yep. versus a forty dollar book for a five e. You can get on Amazon. You yeah. can get a used one as well. Same thing. Yeah. Okay, but you can get probably them even cheaper then if we're talking used and like all I know, the all it, the AD and D stuff. If we're wanting to used. say like all of the material is available online free, okay. We can look at printed material, okay, but also you're available in the same line. Okay, but you're getting into semantics because you know you lost this one. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about the point. Yeah. I'm wanting to make it clear that all of them are in the relative yes. same dimension for playability at cost. I care about the point, and I think we proved that we can play the game at a... Right, I'm just stuck Fair enough, thing. you proved that you could play the we game for free. We are not as free as you, sure, yes. but I still think we merit a point. No, because if we're figuring out, like, a winner in this debate, you, sure. the cost is more to play 5e if you want the expansion materials. It's more, hands down. Now, popularity, yeah, 5e is the most popular yeah, edition, hands down. And then 3.5, AD&D &D comes say, in last. 3.5 still played quite a oh, bit. Oh, it is. No, no, yeah, I would say 5e is definitely the most popular, but yeah. I would say 3.5 is a close second. It really is. 5e will continue to gain more players, but 3.5 is still incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. But 4e is really where it's at. No, yeah. it's not. You can get out. <laughs> we should have just gone and hopped on 4e sure, while we man. had the chance. We knew they would win. I mean, we're doing... And they don't even have a rep here. We're doing well enough. We could be fair, two editions cost of 4e... Yikes. You can't actually find, because they're not available, because nobody wants it. Actually oh, do you want our copy? Uh, oh, you have one that's not in the dumpster? <laughs> That's where I had Anyways, my last back. one. Popularity, Sorry. we talked about yes. that. Let's let's talk about that. Okay, the next category is playability. Yeah, we won that. Okay, well, cool. I said Stranger Things. Hell yeah. Um, playability is a little bit of a vague qualification. I was going to say, this is going to come down to what you like. We all get a point. You can play all of them. I think it... I know, I think... I'm going to be honest, out of everything that we've said tonight, I believe everybody deserves a point in playability because none of these additions is 4E. Is 4E. <laughs> yes! Thank you! <laughs> I, like, I'll say, Play like, 4E right, e is a playable edition. It's not what we're mm. used to. We do a lot of theater of the mind and storytelling Dungeons and Dragons. I know four everybody yeah. player-wise. 4E four, yeah. four e is going to appeal to people that like games more like Warhammer. Where they yes. want a tabletop battle simulator. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely. I personally, not my jam. I'll trash on 4E all the time because it's not my jam. But like, 
for the player that based, likes based that, four is a playable edition. Based on sales and popularity, it wasn't anyone's jam. It's true. <laughs> okay, final point. The ability for new players to create a party that in, like encourages them to work together. The category is called Party Power. Oh, 3-5 is fantastic. And 5 I'm Based on what I've heard about your system, I'm going to say yours is probably the worst at this because anyone can do anything. No, no that no, is no, not no. what we said. A lot we of the crux also... of your... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the crux of AD&D is you have to have people in different classes because they're so specialized. Same thing with 3-5. Same thing with 5-E. Yeah. I, I would say that mm-hmm. the crux of one of your previous arguments that you made during this last little stint of the... Uh, recording is that you can do like two is or ad and d is geared towards you just doing anything it, like your whole thing was you like you can attempt yeah you can attempt to do but anything. that 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 in and of itself that uh proclivity to going off and doing whatever and not being bound by the abilities of your party and your the abilities of what you can do as a player within your proficiencies to me screams AD and D is great for the selfish player, great for the player that wants to do their badass thing, and then the next player gets to do their but badass thing. I would counter that and say five E is actually honestly three point five. I would I'm going to take away three point five. So the reason I say this is in AD and D and D forced you to I know <laughs> we're passionate. You, I know it. English. It Woo. forced you to create like like when we first played an example when we first were playing AD and D the first time I ever played basically I was like what did everybody pick They're like this. But we need a cleric Same because thing. of how the party goes. No, but you can create a rogue could basically do whatever they want in 5e and not rely on the party to get stuff done. They go out ahead. They do all these checks. They can sneak and get their Operate. stuff. They can do backstabs. And, but in the party, it's different for a rogue. A rogue has way less health. A rogue has way less abilities um, in the front line, especially when they're captured. And I feel like just... Because not everybody can do everything. They can attempt to do everything, which is nice, but they won't They won't pass. They're not going to be able to. AD&D is great in that you can do anything for the narrative, but the characters are very specialized compared to the newer editions. That is the same exact as 3.5 and 5e. You I just said that you can, build, you can build a god slayer. Yeah, and he will be good in combat, and he will be garbage everywhere else. That's the whole point of min-maxing is you maximize one attribute and minimize everything else. And you need someone you need else someone in your party to, to pick in. up on that slack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like Rogues I'm... in 3-5 are extremely good at finding traps. They're great at crawling through a dungeon. But as soon as you get into combat, you just kind of back off and wait for a moment to do an opportune strike because you don't belong in combat. That's why rogues die a lot of the time. Because they jump into the fray thinking they can one-shot everything. But I'm also going to speak to the... Uh, abilities of classes in 5e so many of them actually impact your team look at um cleric's a bad example because clerics just exist in every form and are always a support class but you look at paladins who have an aura which that affects your entire team within a radius i will say the fact that clerics exist as a support class adds to party power adds to that's their role in the party they're the healers, they're the support class. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is not true in 5e at all. I guess. Thank you. <laughs> depending on the cleric. Yeah. Depending yeah. on the cleric. Yeah. But they Most all have clerics. channel divinity, which yeah, I mean, serves as a support. They clerics have, have spirit the... guardians, spirit weapons, and what Clerics have the ability to be very much the support class. I do say, like, yeah. 5e does set clerics up to feel more like a combat class in other editions but you still could play your cleric that way and normally i found that if you don't play your cleric that way you're a pretty inefficient player overall because while they can do those things my clerics are always like decent but not great at anything spirit guardians and spirit weapon the fact that you can have those both active at the same time makes a cleric an extremely effective combat class I think that all of the classes in 5e encourage players to do combat more than previous editions. I would agree with that. There's very few classes that are weak in combat in 5e. Yeah, which I guess just because of the lack of options in AD&D, it encourages people to create a party with different classes. You cannot survive in a party of all rogues in a regular D&D campaign in AD&D. 
but you could in 5e because no. there's all these different archetypes. That's a quitter's but. attitude, but... Yeah. I'm just saying... I'm going to say that's entirely DM dependent. Yeah. Okay, it depends on if they want to homebrew a quest written specifically for Well, rogues, let's, let's but, see how this next campaign goes before we start passing judgment on how well, well we survive. Fine, but I'm saying, like... We're lasting one session, sorry. <laughs> cool. okay. I'm just saying, like, a point. we have fighters, rogues... Bow guys. Magic users, and, like, Y'all got paladins, because I was one. Yeah, we have paladins, we have druids, and we have assassins. You've got all the core classes, I mean, for like, the most part. But those are, they like, all the four. fit into, like, four major categories, though, because a bard and a druid and a thief slash assassin are all rogues. A paladin and a fighter are both fighters. Fighters. Like the fighter class. Um... And then you have your magic users, and there are different types of magic in AD&D as well. You still have the illusionists, the conjurists, and those sorts of things. But you don't have sorcerers, warlocks, and mages. You just have, like, a magic user with a school. Right. And then you have, what did I miss? The, the, the cleric. cleric. You have clerics, basically. <laughs> See, I feel like that's just and so, like, nailed it. it. It encourages people to pick from each part, you know, from each section. I think... Three five I, AD or five E is very much so. Everything is good at combat, but like three five, you definitely need a good mix. You can't go into battle with. Well, you could go into battle with a bunch of fighters, but as soon as you enter a dungeon, you're done. You're just gonna hit every trap because no one knows what they're doing. No one can sense magic. No one can do anything like that. Whereas you need a rogue to take care of that, or some sort of other class with those abilities to take care of that. Now, and and with five e too, and I, I guess for starters, I'm going to make a statement that's just universal, like all editions. Right. Yeah. I think that players and parties are naturally drawn to building a level of cohesion in their party. Oh mm-hmm. I, Every time I played, even with brand new players who know nothing about D and D, they go, "We need someone to heal us. We need someone that's going to yeah. be strong. We need someone that's ranged." Have you watched high schoolers play D and D though? No. Oh god. But everybody i played with which goes back to when I was high not school. high schoolers but freshman year of college which is pretty close people have been drawn to try and balance the party out until you're experienced enough that you decide we're all going to be jerks and make a party full of rogues until until um, you come in and don't know what everyone else yeah. is making for a campaign but you balance your party you until you feel like you don't have to and <laughs> it's, it's not good because of that i think you can find <laughs> this balance and this party power in any edition in theory but 5e offers that capability you still can play a support cleric but at the same time your cleric's not going to feel like they completely are worthless in combat when they go out there because they still have capabilities that are useful same with bards you don't feel like you have to hide behind a pillar and throw out a spell every once in a while or play your loot because you're completely ineffective a bard can still hold their own they just might not be the tank i would like to say so with the introduction of like milestone leveling that's really Mm -hmm. popular with 5e What's the point of everybody needing to be good in combat because you don't have to worry about kill stealers? So shouldn't the clerics and bards only be specialized and not be good at combat? Because that's their job is to heal people. Shouldn't they have access to more healing spells and not have a balance like within the character creation between combat ability and magic? It, I feel like it just makes people just want to create people who are good in combat because it's the only time they get to do something cool. And, and I'm going to to speak to that in everybody wants to feel like they contributed. Mm-hmm. And if you're ever in a situation where you just totally trounce a boss and you didn't take a single point of damage, your cleric sitting there like, man, I didn't even need to heal anybody that fight. I did nothing. So that player sat there for nothing. And that does not make a player feel good. So if they can feel that they contributed in any fashion, even if that's combat, because guess what? Players find combat fun. Majority of players find combat fun. Mm -hmm. And if they can hit things with their imaginary characters against these imaginary evils, yeah, that's fucking fun. I mean, that's a good point. But I will tell you, playing a cleric in AD&D, I just didn't sit there and wait for somebody to get hurt. There was a ton that a cleric can do with against the healing i was able to bless sanctuary yes bless sanctuary 
Um, I was able to give boost to characters. You do the light thing. You make character. You make enemies easier to hit, which Very gives you a plus. Better. I loved it. I loved playing a cleric. There was so much behind the scenes that I did, and I never got so in AD and D. A lot of it is um, by experience, and everybody has a different experience level to level. And so, yes, fighters need more experience because fighters are the ones killing, and you get experience yeah. for killing. But as a cleric, I got experience for buffing. I got experience for using magic. I got experience for helping, like, helping somebody kill something. That's what I did. I got assist experience. So I didn't feel like I wasn't doing anything. I was an essential part of the party. The reason the fighter could hit the damn thing is because I lit it up in a dark cave. So that's what I'm saying. I don't need to fight to be mm -hmm. useful. Like I said, I've never done AD&D, &D, but there's no support-based class in 3-5 that's just healing. Like, you are doing other stuff. Right, you and, 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 and I've played Cleric in AD&D, &D. I played it in 5e, like, I play Cleric because I like supporting. Mm -hmm. Are you a Mercy main? No. Oh. Get out of here. I'm a Hanzo man. <laughs> but everybody knows. Wow. Alright, we're, we're gonna have another we're gonna have another debate after this. I've only played Overwatch like four times. What the fuck do you have against Mercy mains? I don't have anything <laughs> against Mercy mains. I was just teasing. I love playing some but classes the, the, and shooters. I'm just teasing. There's also that point where like when you can cast these support abilities. If your players are already rolling high enough to where your bless was useless, again, that's another point where you don't feel like you really contributed. I mean, you, you're also going to... It's equally balanced by all the times that you do contribute. Because, like, there are plenty of times when your bless is the difference between hitting and missing. And, right. Can uh, we wrap this up a little bit? Yeah. 5e, give me one concise statement as to why 5e would encourage new players to create a party power balanced party. Because every class is pretty much equal on footing for power, whether early or late, and gives you freedom to do what you want throughout the game. Everybody can be contributory in some way, but then you start looking at where the specialties lie, and that's where you start distributing things because... A, everybody wants to feel special, you feel like you can contribute, but also B, when you see those things and you're paying attention to what's focused because you know that every character is going to be able to deal some degree of damage in combat, you can look at your party and say, we've got a guy that uses bows to deal their damage, I'm going to use my sword, you're going to play a magic user, this person wants to be able to heal, maybe we want someone that can play support like a bard. They okay. are paying more attention to the specialties and picking and choosing where they come into play in the party's dynamic. Okay, I think that finally got you the point. Okay. Okay, so I am going to do the scientific edition. I honestly think these are pretty even, but we'll see when the math comes out. Notice that the 4E page had no points. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we actually had a 4E. No, no. <laughs> it's got coffee stands and used gum on it. You can probably do story building, storytelling and world building in 4 Actually, you probably can't, can you? Not it's it's God. it's a different type. No, no, it is. It I okay. So I've already created a campaign for four E. While she's calculating, I'm gonna talk about yeah, this in a minute. Sure. I've already created a campaign for E. I've already built characters, and I will tell you, you can build a world in four E, but I have a book on how the world is supposed to run, and I have oh to keep up with God. that. So Literally, as we play, <laughs> I change things, and it's really that annoying. Said any good DM is going to change the world and the mechanics yeah. and the way that things run on the fly in the session. Which, yes. If a session goes perfectly as what you wrote before, that means that either, A, your players aren't working hard enough to piss you off, or B, you're too predictable. And they're too predictable. And or you're railroading as fuck. Yeah, or you're or railroading. Okay, no, I get that. I'm just saying... That's probably the worst No, one. I'm just saying... I'm not saying change as in the story has a change. I'm saying I'm erasing on paper and updating things. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about changing on the fly. Yeah. All right. I don't like that look. <laughs> yeah, I don't like where this is at. <laughs> Unbiased. 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 Oh, oh guys, that's crazy. Post, you guys, guys got none. And did three play got five Did three play five I hope so much. Drum roll, please. We'll add it in post. 3.5 comes in third place with a whopping total of 15 out of 25 points. Unbiased moderator. Suck it, nerd. <laughs> 
No offense to people who love 3.5. Um, it's just the worst every, edition. Everybody, I'm just sitting around a bunch no, no, of, a no, table no. with a bunch of people who don't know how to do math. That's why they don't like 3.5. <laughs> they don't understand that math is amazing. Hey, Fair you, enough. You beat 4th edition. You beat 4th edition. That's all that matters. So I did that potato on your counter. Yeah. <laughs> 3.5 only lost because it's not popular with new players right now and because there are so many rules it's hard to access for people so if you love D, &D you should give 3.5 a try but it did lose on our the great debate scoring card so who won if, if we get <laughs> so, second place just stop recording and delete yeah i'm yes. gonna just nuke my last oh my stop <laughs> okay so there is a one point difference okay between a d and d and 5e and I swear to you, I swear to you, I was marking... This means that A&D this, this won. Right? Listen, like, listen, she has to qualify I it. need to qualify it because I was marking every time I heard a good argument for any of these categories. And I'm looking this over right now. And I made the best arguments, so... <laughs> and the only category... Hmm. Okay. The only category where one beat the other was question number three. What are the benefits for the dungeon master? Hold on. Okay. Maybe, maybe she's pulling our leg here. No, she's not pulling our leg. No, AD&D no, I, I saw her do that, Marks. AD&D won with 19 out of 25 points. 5E won with 18. Or came in second. I'm sorry. AD&D won with 19 out of 25 points. 5E came in second with 18 out of 25 points. I think if you're being fair... That we could category, give a one point margin of error for bias, and they're tied. No, that category could really just depend on the player. Who is the DM? What do they prefer? Yeah. Really, they're neck and neck because the main negative to AD and D is Thacko, which is annoying for the dungeon master to calculate. However, it's easier to create a DM buster in Five E. Really not. Absolutely not. Really not. Uh, hold on. Absolutely no, no, we not. don't need to debate this anymore. Yes. So we are close enough here that we've got you also effectively a tie. It really, it really is. I'm going to be completely honest. So I would agree with you. I, it's it, this all is about the DM. I think we're going to have to have people weigh in themselves. Oh yeah, and definitely. Give us mm -hmm. your opinions. Mm -hmm. Right, and please do give us your opinions because. I'm sure we have a lot of proponents for different editions out there who are listening to this debate and are itching to add yeah. to the conversation. This person said this thing wrong. This person didn't even touch on that. We had way more time than we probably should have spent on this. We still could debate this for hours yep. and probably will after the mic turns off. So please yeah. weigh in with other things. Sheet, I'm going to correct her on everything she didn't mark. Yeah. I Except didn't... for bustability and comprehension. I marked, <laughs> if, I, if I heard an argument made for this, maybe the point was lost because... It wasn't talked about. Mm -hmm. Fair. Maybe you just didn't make the point. Not that it doesn't exist, but you didn't make the point. So, to be fair, that's just how it works in a debate. But, essentially, it's a tie. So, millennials, please let us know what you think in the comments on MFG TV, our YouTube channel, or on our Facebook page, Millennial Focus Group. We really want to hear your opinions. Also, thank you so much for our guests on this episode, James, Justin, and Matt Hart. Thank you. Yay, thank you guys so much. You Sex raised my blood pressure, but in a good way. Good night, millennials. Bye. Bye. Peace out, yo.